Good morning, please be seated. Make sure cell phones are turned on. Today is December 5, 2019. We are here with regard to the trial in the matter of Douglas and Rosalind Barden versus Johnson and Johnson, David and Darlene Etheridge versus Johnson and Johnson, D'Angelo Latino versus Johnson and Johnson, and William and Elizabeth Ronning versus Johnson and Johnson. May I have appearances, please, on behalf of the plaintiffs? Uh, Chris Pan is here, Chris Placentella, and Mosh Mondo, and the Army of the Etheridges, the Barden's, the Ronings, and the Spinelli. Thank you. And on behalf of the defendants, Johnson & Johnson and Johnson & Johnson Consumer Incorporated. Good morning, jurors. I have Sullivan and Jack Nolan today. Good morning. Thank you. So, um, jurors, you could hand back your envelopes to the office. <coughs> Everyone has their notebooks? So, uh, let us continue where we let off from yesterday, Mr. Panettiere. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, everybody. All right, so I am going to, um, we talked a lot about causation and the asbestos in the product yesterday, but now I want to get into the story. This is a story and tell you about what Johnson & Johnson was doing every step of the way. And then when I finish, um, Mr. Placitella is going to stand up. He's going to talk to you a little bit about Ms. McNeil, and then Moshe is going to stand up and talk to you a little bit about Mr. Harvey and Mr. Ron. So, Remember yesterday we stopped off here where Nancy Musco had said that there was no tremolite in the product, no asbestos in the product. And um, Ms. Sullivan had said, well, someone has screwed up. So in, in our own words, we deposed Ms. Musco. I'm going to show you just a quick 30-second uh, clip of what she said. But in a certain with all the respect, it says this is true and accurate to the best of my knowledge. And my question is, what specifically did you do to assure yourself that it was true and accurate? You never looked at a single document? No. Okay, so that's the first thing, is the person who was swearing under oath that Johnson & Johnson chose didn't look at anything. She said it was true. She swore to it. Under oath, that's the same oath that you take here in the courtroom that the witnesses take. She swore to it, said it was true, but hadn't looked at a single thing. Also, never said I was mistaken. Never said, oh, it's just an error. She was deposed. That Those words never came out of her mouth. Yes, ma'am. But what you stated, and I have it here, um, is that this is what you told everybody from 1981 until the day you left. There is no evidence that Johnson's baby powder contained any amount of asbestos and that there was never, never was, and there never will be. This document is absolutely inconsistent with that representation, is it not? This is the first I have heard of this, Dr. Brown. It's the first I have seen this. So I, I can't comment on this. Then here, here's why this is so extremely important. is because the person that she was working with was in-house counsel Don O'Shaughnessy. Okay? He was the one that she was working with to answer those interrogatories. He was the one who received the communication about Alice Blount in 1998. So those interrogatories that she signed were 2000, okay? She's working with him. Two years earlier, he got the communication regarding Alice Blount where she says there's asbestos in the baby powder. So it's the in-house Johnson & Johnson lawyers that chose not to provide Nancy Musco with that information. Now, Ms. Musco could have asked to review the documents, okay? She didn't, but the lawyers who chose what to do, who chose what her words would be when they told her to swear, they didn't give her what they have. They had their own consultant who they tried to retain as an expert okay, in 1998. They had her saying there's asbestos in the product and they didn't provide that to the person who was swearing under oath that there was no asbestos. And that was the in-house lawyer for Johnson & Johnson. So the lawyers made the determination as to what was going to be communicated and what was not going to be communicated. It was not you. Is that fair? Uh, they, since it's a legal matter, they were the appropriate person to make the final decisions. But they're not the ones that swore under oath to it. See, that's the problem. Is they chose, as Ms. Sullivan said, the burn nurse. Someone that people would trust, okay? Someone who hadn't worked at the company, right? By this time, she hadn't worked at the company for, I believe, over 10 years. But they chose the person that they thought people would trust to swear under oath to these issues but it was the lawyers who made the decisions as to what she would swear to. So, 
1966, and again, I've got this picture of this doctor holding up his hand, stop, because the doctors repeatedly said, stop selling talc for babies. I showed you one from 1959. Here's another from 1966. They get this article that quotes, in conclusion, it is strongly urged that talcum powder be removed from the environment of children and the traditional association of talcum powder and babies be abandoned. It has no medicinal value. Wherever placed, it serves as a foreign body. Remember, it's a rock. Remember? Most people, you know, think talcum powder is some powder. They don't understand. It's a rock dug out of the ground. You look at it under a microscope, it's a microscopic rock. This is what you are putting on a child. But most people don't think about it in those terms. But that is true. It is a foreign body introduced into the lungs of children. And at least three deaths and an unknown morbidity have resulted from the silicate powder. So the doctors are again saying stop. One of the instructions uh, that Judge Viscomi will give you is that to the extent you find a danger existed in the products at the time they were sold or distributed, you must assume that the defendants knew of the dangers of the product at the time the product was sold or distributed. The law here is that regardless of what they actually knew, you have to presume they knew. Because the law says, look, if you sell a product, you are presumed to know about the hazards. Of course, we've proven they did know of the hazards, but this is what the law says. Also, in pro proving a defect in the design of a product, the plaintiffs need not prove that the defendants knew that the injuries alleged in the case could happen as it did. Knowledge of the dangers of the product is legally placed upon the defendants. Okay? So to the extent there were any hazards, they are assumed to have known the hazards. Of course, we've proven here they absolutely actually knew the hazards of the product. Again, in 1969, now they're talking to the Dr. Ford Johnson & Johnson. Remember, August 9th, 1969, um, they write to the company doctor and they say, we're worried about Tremolite. Tell us about Tremolite. And the doctor writes back and says, Pete, well, this is, from, this is the, the letter to the doctor. Pete, we have to firm up the position the company should have on the presence of the mineral Tremolite and talc. Now, again, they don't say Tremolite asbestos. Right? But they're clearly talking about Tremolite asbestos. If Tremolite the chunks of tremolite were an issue. They wouldn't be, they're a non-issue, so they wouldn't be writing this. We have to firm up the company position on tremolite and talc. Your staff will have to do this for us, since the objections to the mineral have been mainly medical or clinical, as opposed to chemical or physical. And the doctor writes back, the problem with tremolite is the needle-like crystals. And I'll call you back to Dr. Hopkins, who said it's the needle-like quality that causes mesothelioma and Dr. Atanus's paper, the needle-like quality causes mesothelioma. It's the size and shape. So the doctor in, in 69 says the problem with tremolite is the needle-like crystals. The danger isn't from skin irritation, it's from inhalation. If it became known that there was tremolite in any significant amount, we could end up in litigation because of disease. 1969. It would be prudent to limit the tremolite. He didn't say tremolite asbestos, though, right? Limit the tremolite, because that's what we're talking about. This is exhibit 2368. Did they come clean or did they cover up? Mr. Nyman brought this up in opening statement. At this point, when the company doctor says we should limit the tremolite because of the concerns for inhalation, and he talked about neoplasia, cancer, from tremolite at that time, did they come clean or did they cover up? You know what they did. So here's the first thing they did. They started by fixing studies. We saw that that doctor said you should do animal studies. They went out and they picked a special batch of talc. They cleared a thousand cans. This is the lot of baby powder, a thousand cans set aside for everybody to do everything on it for the animal studies. Okay? And here's what they did. This is 1971. To make sure that they had a small batch that was absolutely clean so they could use it in the animal studies, they did eight different tests. Remember, I went through this with Dr. Hopkins. They did eight different tests to make sure it was absolutely clean so that there was no asbestos in that tiny batch when they went into the animal studies. But look at what they were doing for what was being sold to the public. Sometimes they did XRD. 
and they did some electron microscopy, but at that time only to rebut what other researchers had said. So when they wanted to fix the animal studies, which is what they were doing here, they weren't sending their typical stuff. When they wanted to do that, they made sure it was absolutely clean, clean through eight different methods. What they were selling to people, maybe it got tested by XRD sometimes, which has the limit of half a percent, which is never going to see anything. And they said, oh, we were doing some TEM, but it was only to rebut other scientists. That wasn't periodic testing. So think about that. When they wanted to do something that was advantageous to them, they tested the heck out of it. But for the stuff they were selling to everybody else, almost nothing. August 3rd, 71, there is a meeting with the FDA. And Johnson & Johnson and all the consultants report that the samples are clean. The samples they were looking at are clean. And in the memo of the meeting, Geiger, who is with, or Geiger, who is with Macron, Geiger questions some of Art Langer's identification of chrysotile fibrils. This was a smokescreen. This was a smokescreen, but a good counteroffensive to Langer finding chrysotile everywhere. Macron, right? The world experts, they're a smokescreen against Langer who is showing Johnson & Johnson in his own office that there's asbestos in the product. Six days later, internal memo. It would seem more than appropriate that we upgrade the quality control on our talc and baby powder, particularly as to the potential asbestos content. So they meet with the FDA six days earlier. They say it's all clean. Then they come back and in the office they say, guys, 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 we got to do something. we got a problem. And he sends that memo two times sends it to two different groups of people internally. It is important that we continue the processing work on the removal of fines from our baby powder since this is the fashion implicated in talcosis and asbestos toxicology. And what did Dr. Hopkins say? He said, oh, that doesn't mean anything. That's superfluous. That's superfluous. I think that means a lot. They were concerned about the fact that there was asbestos and they had dodged this bullet. They had reported to the FDA that our stuff was clean. And now internally they're saying, we got to fix it so it stays that way. Ten days later, quality control should be upgraded and possible presence of asbestos be determined on periodic samples. Because they weren't doing it. August 6th, Bill Ashton. So this is three days later. Bill Ashton writes that Valchazone contains trinolite, actinolite, and chrysotile. In fact, he's ordered a bin of the stuff from the Crescetto mine, which is part of Fontana. Do you remember this argument we had with Dr. Dr. Hopkins? Hopkins, we didn't use Crescetto. He said, we should, he said, I need to see a geological, geological evidence. So I gave him a paper that said, this is the geology, right? And you remember, it said the Fontana mine, which they used, was two sections, Gianna and Crescetto. Okay. And he said, but there's a stream in the middle. So they can't be the same deposit. And then we overlaid the actual deposit. Okay? This was an attempt by him. I don't know why he argued about this. Yes, there's a stream in the middle. The deposit is the same. Okay? But he wanted to pick a fight on that. Because, because, Bill Ashton said there's chrysotile actinolite and trimolite in the Crescetto tap. Okay. All right, 1971, another doctor. This time it's the School of Public Health on, at UC Berkeley. In asking Dr. Cooper his thoughts on concerning the asbestos content of talc and the use of talcs for cosmetics, he indicated that in his opinion there is no place for asbestos in cosmetic talcs and would withdraw from the market any talcs that contain asbestos. He did not believe that there was a low level of asbestos content in talc, which would be acceptable for cosmetic use. Now that's what Johnson & Johnson says publicly, zero tolerance, right? We know that's not true internally. I'm going to show you some of those documents too. So Professor Lewin, now remember, there were lots and lots of people that found, independent people who found asbestos, but there's two that Johnson & Johnson picked to really focus on in this case. One was Professor Lewin and one is Dr. Langer. So Professor Lewin. In 72, remember, he's retained by the FDA to look at a bunch of different products. OK? 
Okay? And they retained him specifically because he'd already been working for industry. They figured he wouldn't, he would be unassailable to attack because he was already their consultant. And when he did his work, he found crisis talents from like dozens and dozens of talents, including Johnson & Johnson baby powder and shower shower. Now, uh, counsel for Johnson Johnson, remember, was this because of the scare back in the 70s? This is what she's talking about. The scare, the only people who were scared was Johnson & Johnson. They circled the wagon. Those independent experts that they talk about, right? Cardiff, McCrone, well themselves, Colorado School of Lines, they say Harvard, MIT, Princeton. Those were individual paid consultants to Johnson & Johnson. Remember Ms. Sullivan kept saying, would Harvard let this happen? Would Princeton let... Princeton and Harvard had nothing to do with it. They hired paid consultants, individual people. Okay, and I'll point out that one of them, Mr. Brown, at, I believe, Princeton, he didn't find any tremolite at all. The mineral, the asbestos, nothing. Something that was in the record for years and years and years. And they said these were the best people. Those are big names, Princeton, Harvard, MIT. These were individual paid consultants for Johnson & Johnson. So they circled the wagons to go after Lewin because the FDA was going to make it public. What happened? Eight days after his report is provided to industry, but not the public, they go on the offensive. They demand all the Lewin samples be rerun, but not with the method he used, XRD. They say most of what he found was chrysotile, so they say he has to confirm it with optical. Why is that important? Because they point out, this is Ian Stewart from McCrone, in subsequent discussion, Mr. Ian Stewart pointed out that light microscopy may not detect chrysotile fibers. Dr. Weisler, he's with the FDA, A, said they recognize that some samples will be passed on that basis but are willing to live with that. So the industry shows up and says, Lewin has to reconfirm these, but not with the testing method he used. Typically when you say confirm something, you confirm it, you, you go back and you look with the same method. They said, no, he's got to use optical. And they point out, it's not going to see the price of time. The FDA, right, who doesn't regulate this stuff but is monitoring it, says, we're fine with that. We accept that. Is that zero tolerance? No, it's absolutely not. And Ms. Sullivan said, you think the FDA is just going to let that happen? Baby powder with asbestos? Yes, I do. Because they said that. Some will be passed on that basis, but they're willing to live with it. I don't know what their motivation was. Right? We're not in their head. But that's what they actually said. They were willing to live with the fact that some samples with asbestos would be passed. Schaffner with the FDA appeared to be sympathetic to our views. So someone in the FDA was sympathetic to their views. That's Exhibit 2436. When I pressed, this is J&J, when I pressed for an assurance that the report would not be issued, Lewin, when issued, he said it would be issued only over my dead body. The FDA is not out there protecting people on top. First, they have no regulatory actual ability to do it. But to the extent there's any illusions that they were, the, that, that's why they're illusions. Because they weren't. They were sympathetic to Johnson & Johnson's point of view, and they said they wouldn't issue the report over their dead body. Dr. Schaffner said that this procedure will be adopted in the proposed policy statement. He asked if anyone present had any toxicological objections to the allowance of 1% asbestos. No objections. Meeting Johnson & Johnson is that. Did you ever think that this company, right, with the ads, with the mother and the child, would have been advocating for 1% asbestos allowance in baby powder? Objection. No. Overruled. No. None of us would have. So Lewin's final results did exactly what J&J &J and CTFA thought they would do. He confirmed almost nothing with optical microscopy which is what they wanted. That's not zero tolerance. So this attack was willfully, willfully misleading during the time on Professor Lewin. This is uh, Dr. Nicholson from Johnson & Johnson. So let me ask the question again. One, two, three, four, five, six tests that you submitted to the FDA to determine whether there was asbestos in the talc you would not find tremoli at a low level, correct? Yes. And six of the tests that you submitted to the FDA, you would not find chrysotile asbestos below two or three percent, correct? Correct. Okay. 
those six and seven reports, that was the MIT, the Princeton, the, the Harvard they were talking about. That's Johnson and Johnson admitting that they knew they wouldn't see the terminal end of the chrysotile that they sent to the FDA. That's completely dishonest. And it was all to assail Professor Lewitt who had found it. But the FDA internally confirmed asbestos in the shower to shower. Remember sample 84? 107,000 fibers per gram in sample 84, in Lewin's sample 84. That's exhibit 2927. Internally, they confirmed it as well. Remember, we have the handwritten notes from Robert Roll. About one fiber or rod slash needle every 500 particles, one third of those are tremolite. And then that didn't stop Johnson & Johnson from trying to mislead you here. Remember, they, they showed you a count sheet from nine months later, or actually over a year later, where they said, look, this has an 84. Remember, sample 84 was the shower shower. And they said, this has an 84 in the corner. It had other numbers and letters, too. And it said, baby powder. And they said, this, this is no asbestos. This must be sample 84 they were looking at. And they went back to that again and again and again, trying to nail that square peg into that round hole to try to convince you that somehow a count sheet that was done in September of 74 was the count sheet for sample 84 in December of 73. Again, misleading. Pooley tested TEM and found nothing, Ms. Sullivan said. Well, this is the report that went to the FDA. Particles formed from the amphibole mineral found at the mine were hardly fibrous in character. But we saw with Dr. Hopkins, I said hardly fibrous, meaning some of it was, which is what we said in this whole case, right? Some of what goes into the talc is fibrous. That's the asbestos. And Dr. Hopkins said, oh, in, in England, hardly means none. But we showed him what Dr. Poe himself said. Here's the question. So he didn't quote it here, but you found tremolite that was asbestiform that didn't break apart, didn't you? Yes, a few particles. Remember, by TEM. A few particles by TEM is a lot. That didn't go to anybody. A few particles by TEM is millions or billions of fibers per gram. This is Dr. Hopkins. And in eight ounces of Johnson's baby powder, there would be tens to hundreds of trillions of particles, correct? Answer, I don't think anyone has ever counted them, but you could estimate there would be many, many trillions, yes. If you had just 0.00001% chrysotile, and there are only one trillion, a trillion particles in the whole bottle, not tens or hundreds, you would still have 10 million fibers per container, correct? That's the math, yes. Okay. So this again is that, that, point of, that point we've been talking about, and I'll just kind of write it down, which is, I got which is right, even at point zero 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 one percent, okay. Only if there were was one trillion particles, which we know is way more than that of the total talc particles, then you have you have ten million <coughs> fibers at this what seems like a low percentage by weight, right? We think of things in weight and we go, wow, that's a low percentage by weight. But these fibers weigh almost nothing. So that's why it's so important when Ms. Sullivan was talking about, look at these low percentages by weight. Remember, that could be tens to hundreds of millions of fibers per gram. Johnson & Johnson confirmed chrysotile as well through Macron. Remember, Macron went and met with Dr. Hutchison. He found it in a current sample of shower to shower and Lewin supplied to his laboratory. And Ms. Sullivan said, yeah, but we got his bill. He only spent two hours on it. Well, he took the pictures. There's the pictures of the chrysotile. He provided SAED and EDS all to Johnson & Johnson, right? If he had not found it, right? She said he moved so quickly. If he had not found anything, the fact that he moved quickly would be a criticism. You'd say, well, he didn't spend much time on it. However long it took him, he found it, and he provided it to Johnson & Johnson. The problem is then Johnson & Johnson lied about it three times. Here's the first. And on September 20th, Dr. Hutchinson met with Johnson & Johnson 
in the O'Hare Airport, handed over his handwritten notes, and told you in his handwritten notes that he found chrysotile asbestos in the shower to shower using transitional electron microscope, correct? Yes, that's what he thought he found. And on September 21, the next day, you met with the FDA and reported that McCrone and Hutchinson never found chrysotile asbestos in shower to shower, correct? That's correct. So on September 20th, he gives them the report that says there's chrysotile asbestos. On the 21st, they meet with the FDA and they said he said no chrysotile asbestos. They lied. And listen to the language that these representatives for Johnson & Johnson used. Yes, that's what he thought he found, right? No one ever contradicted what Hutchison found. He had pictures of it. He had the crystal. He had the three steps, the morphology, the crystal, and the chemistry. They had the chrysotile in the product, in their product and the lumen sample. They told the FDA he was negative. That's a lie. Here's the second lie. And what you told the FDA was that there wasn't a shred of evidence to support the idea that either Johnson & Johnson baby power shower shower contained any chrysotile asbestos, correct? Not a shred of evidence. Yes. That's three months after they received the Hutchison results. So that's the second lie they told. And then the third. And this one, this one is the one where they documented it, and you can actually see the lie with your own eyes. So here's his report. TEM shows less than 1 100th of 1% 1 asbestos in the material given to us. He found it in the two samples. That's his report that they had. This is what went to the FDA. The exact quote, the extensive investigation reported, the extensive investigation reported, right? The exact quotation with the highlighted part turned into dot, dot, dot. Okay? That's lie number three. They kept this. This went to the FDA. That's in the end. Inbox? Outbox. They also preferred tremolite in the Johnson's baby powder. Right? Substantially asbestos form free. Remember that discussion? Right. Substantially. Except that there's 0.3 to 0.5% tremolite. That's the asbestos form they found in the baby powder that Lewin had. Do not use this report. Right? Do not use. But then they changed the results and backdated the report. They knew it was being redone. And the new one, a few rods of tremolite. Percentage is missing. Right? And what did Ms. Soldier say? She said, oh no, this change actually gave more information. That's ludicrous. This change, when they deleted the percentages, which were fairly high, 0.3 and 0.5, of tremolite asbestos, by deleting that, they gave more information to the FDA. Dr. Langer, he found asbestos in the Johnson & Johnson. He showed it to them in his office. Then he wrote to them a few months later, and he reiterated his findings by TEM. Then, New York Times, seven months later, publishes preliminary results. Remember where they said there was 5 and 20% asbestos? And then Langer, the next day, quickly corrects and says it wasn't 5 or 25%. It was trace, trace asbestos. Right? You were shown this. Langer says there was trace asbestos in the baby pie. Okay. So that's one day and two days, right? We've got two days. Look what Johnson & Johnson did. On the 17th, they write a memo about what happened on the 16th. I asked Dr. Langer if he can state that our, asbestos, that our baby powder is free of asbestos as a result of the conference and review of August 3rd, 71 with the FDA. He said he still thinks that J&J's product contains minute traces of asbestos and he believes he can find asbestos fibers after breaking down the platelets by ultrasonic energy. So they got one quote from him. He was quoted in the paper. And they asked for a second quote. Can you say that it's asbestos free? He said, no, I won't say that. This is extremely important because then the president of the company, six days later, tells everybody in the company that Langer said he was wrong and cleared the products. Remember what Langer said? He said, by optical, we weren't finding it. 
By TEM, we found trace asbestos in the baby powder. But the president of the company tells all the employees that's Langer cleared it all. Langer admitted he was totally wrong. This is important because what Ms. Sullivan said was, this has to be a massive conspiracy. That the whole company? No, not the whole company. Just the people who are in charge, these executives and these managers who are making these policy decisions, and they were deciding what to communicate to the public. But unfortunately, a company operates through its management and its executives. And they here chose to lie to their employees. Objection. Overruled. And then, of course, Langer maintains it to this day. We showed you this article from December of 2018. In a recent interview, Mr. Langer told the Times that Dr. Chalmers, remember he was the, the uh, dean of Mount Sinai, Dr. Chalmers spoke for himself and for the institution, not our research group. He reiterated that his team had detected asbestos in Johnson's baby powder. I stand by that today. Absolutely, he said. So this discussion of, oh, everybody recanted. No, nobody recanted. But as scientists, Dr. Langer said, the initial numbers were high, right? said, by TEM, we found trace asbestos. And he maintains that to today. And then Ms. Nicholson testified, or Dr. Nicholson testified, that 73 was the last year J&J &J sent any product testing to the FDA. And by the way, what was that product testing? It was all the rebuttal stuff to Lewin. That's what it was. That's the only stuff they sent to the FDA. Why? Now, Johnson & Johnson said, now, anybody can test it. We aren't hiding anything. Let's see what they said internally. Remember in 73, it is our joint conclusion that we should not rely on the clean line approach as a protective device for baby powder in the current asbestos or asbestiform controversy, right? Because they had always said, it's a clean mine. Our mines are clean. There's nothing in them. Here they're saying, we can't do that anymore. We believe that this mine would be very clean. However, we are also confident that fiber forming or fiber type minerals could be found. The usefulness of the clean mine approach for asbestos only is over. Why? Because it is possible for the technique of identification for asbestos or asbestiform materials will be an optical approach. It is probable. It probably will be some variation of the Macron method. This method, with appropriate concentrating techniques, will permit a good lab laboratory to identify asbestos or tremolite in a toxin. The reason we have to abandon our defense of our mind as clean in terms of asbestos is because if the lab uses concentration techniques, they're going to find it. So they had to look for some other way to address this problem because they knew people were going to keep finding it. First, they said to the FDA, our preliminary calculations indicate substantial asbestos can be allowed safely in a baby powder. That was the first defense, right? Now that people are finding it, we're going to tell the FDA we think it's safe. Substantial asbestos, again, the PR you see from the company that you've grown up with, the commercials, all of that, versus what actually they were doing. Two very different things. That's not zero tolerance. Ms. Sullivan said, this guy at the FDA was nuts. Who wants 1% in asbestos? Right? And this is the guy she was talking about. Heinz Ironman. Do you see that little asterisk by his name? Who was this crazy guy? Former Jane j employee. The former Jane j employee was the ones advocating for 1% once he got to the FDA. Five months later, Jane j takes the crazy suggestion seriously. They write to the FDA and they say, the calculation shows uh, that a substantial safety factor can be expected with talc containing 1% weight-for-weight asbestos fibers. Therefore, methods capable of determining less than 1% asbestos in talc are not necessary to assure safety of cosmetic talc. There are words to describe how offensive that is. From, a, from the perspective of the people who trust this company, that they were advocating for asbestos in the product for, for an allowance of 1%, that their former employee had suggested once he got to the FDA. He suggested it in the FDA, and they said, yeah, that's a good idea. So they advocated it. And again, they started to advocate it because they knew people were finding it. 
that's not zero tolerance. That's something completely different. And we know that Johns Manville, the giant manufacturer of asbestos, they also found asbestos, Christ's tile in the baby powder in the Italian, in the raw Italian towel. The concentration techniques were showing asbestos. And by the way, I know that Ms. Sullivan kept saying, spiked, 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 spiked. They were looking at spiked to test the methods and non-spiked. This is Dartmouth. This is Professor Reynolds. Actinolite and anthophyllite fiber forms in the non-spiked talc ore. And this is asbestos. Hopkins admitted that's asbestos. Remember, in this, in this uh, experiment, they spiked with actinolite. Okay, not anthophyllite. They found the anthophyllite in just the raw ore. What, when they do dope the samples or spike the samples, why are they doing that? Well, they tell us ground ore from the Hammondsville mine was doped with 1% by weight of the fibrous form of anthophyllite, which occurs as a rare mineral in the Hammondsville ore body. That's why, they're, that's why they're testing these methods. They're testing it with what they find in the ore. It's not that hard to understand. And then here's the one that Reynolds did, right? They had the raw ore, and then they had three spike samples to test their concentrating technique. They found asbestos in all of them. Obviously, you'd expect it in the spike, but they found it in the raw ore in both. Again, this one. Concentration techniques, Pooley. He found a, a tremolite in the Italian and actinolite in Vermont. And they said the concentration technique is too sensitive. And again, Ms. Sullivan tried to say, well, you don't want it to be too sensitive because if it's too sensitive, um, you can get a false positive. You could just start finding stuff that isn't asbestos. That's an interesting lawyer argument, but it's not what the document says. In fact, they said they looked for chrysotile and they didn't see it. Remember, Hopkins said, well, it could turn up chrysotile and, not, and it not really be there. They didn't say that at all. It's too sensitive because it found it. And how do we know that? This isn't just Chris telling you this. They said it. 1975, we deliberately have not included a concentration technique as we felt it would not be in the worldwide company interest to do this. Guys, the technique, the concentration technique, was binned in the 70s because it was sensitive enough to find the asbestos. They didn't want it as part of the, con as part of the uh, specs. They didn't want it as part of the standards that the CTFA was using because it had the ability to see it. That's 3179. That's not zero tolerance. So now they know the labs can readily find the asbestos. They scramble to get it out. So remember, they do this reagent system where they say, although the data accumulated for the specific mineral species fibrous anthophyllite, the same results can be predicted for other fibrous uh, amphibole minerals and chrysotile asbestos Found, found in association with the Hammondsville ore body, right? So they're saying, we have anthophyllite and chrysotile, we know they're there, so we're going to try to add these reagents to get rid of them. And they say, when we used the N-butanol citric acid system, we were able to suppress chrysotile. And then the writer says, the use of these systems is strongly urged uh, by this writer to provide the protection against what are currently considered to be materials presenting a severe health hazard and are potentially present in all talc ores in use at this time. They're trying to get rid of it because they know people can see it. That's a, by the way, that's a good thing to do. That's a great thing to do. Try to get rid of it if you know it's there. But the first thing you do is stop selling the product until you fix the problem. And remember, they told the FDA if there was any indication of any hazard whatsoever, we would take it off the market. That was a lot. Okay? Because here they're scrambling to try to get it out, and it stayed on the market. Okay? And people were using the product, continued to use it. What they find is that if you add N-butanol, it reduced the asbestos sevenfold. If you add N-butanol plus citric acid, you reduce it 20-fold. And we know that they picked and butanol. The end butanol citric acid will only be resorted to in the future event of need for greater suppression of asbestiform. Right? If techniques get better and people can see it at a lower level, maybe we'll add citric acid. But why did they not do it right then? They told us why. Due to continuing and even growing attention shown by scientific and regulatory groups, 
to particulate size, shape, and respirable particles. We should, of necessity, avoid changes to the product which would increase our vulnerability to criticism or suspicion. People would wonder what happened if the product changed in any way because it increased the amount of talc and decreased the amount of asbestos. So they didn't use the better one because they wanted to avoid suspicion and it made them vulnerable to criticism or suspicion. So they, they had one that could make it twice, three times as safe as n butanol, and they chose not to. And then they tried so, so very hard to tell you that these samples were spiked, the ones that they were using in the experiment. Remember, there was anthophilite that they spiked. We said, look, they doped it with anthophilite. And then they sent raw ore to Macron that found chrysotile. Remember, uh, Dr. Hopkins said, there's the one with the Swiss roll, right? There's the little Swiss roll. He said, that showed it was, they were spiking it. No, that was taken in March, three months before Macron analyzed and found chrysotile in the samples. And then this one, he said, then there was one with handwriting. Because I remember one with handwriting where it says samples were doped. And I took them through these sample numbers, 66 US-C. We matched them up, and they didn't match at all. And he said, OK, I admit it. I don't have any proof. The point you were trying to make, sir, was that the results for chrysotile here were the results of spiking. That's the point you were trying to make. Is that true? Yes, but you have no proof. I have no proof. And guys, come back to the point, which was when they did spike, why were they doing it? Because they wanted to mimic what they were finding in the ore anyway and test whether or not these systems worked to reduce what they knew to be in the ore in the first place. They tried then to destroy the asbestos. They send samples to Colorado School of Mines, try to destroy it. And Hopkins said, oh, they were just experimenting just in case. They sent samples of Italian and Vermont out and said, please destroy the asbestos. And said so they were just experimenting. It didn't work. They said, the assumptions we believe to be incorrect are as follows that talc can be processed to remove asbestiform particles. They knew. So after all of their experimentation, they knew they couldn't do it. And Dr. Hopkins said, Johnson & Johnson always knew, always understand, that regard, regardless of the efforts, whether it was beneficiation, flotation, all of those steps, the reagents, they could never get rid of the asbestos to the extent it was present. But that's not what they told customers. They told customers, and this is a letter to Ms. Sorensen, a letter to Ms. Houston. They said, the talc ore then undergoes a cleansing procedure known as flotation that involves many separate washing operations to remove any impurities which might be present. And we know, because we showed you the letter from Ms. Sorensen, she'd seen a newspaper article. She said, I love baby powder, but now I can't use it. Please tell me there's no asbestos in it. And they said, yeah, we test it, but we also wash it. They knew the washing was meaningless. The washing, by the way, is just the flotation. So they lied to those people. They also said it to OSHA and the FDA. This is 1994. Bill Ashton signed this. The FDA says, would asbestos survive the talc refining process you described? Wet beneficiation, flaw rotation, has the processing potential to remove asbestos from talc. However, talc subjected to wet beneficiation is no asbestos in the first place. We know that's not true, but it's also not true that they could remove it. And the FDA wanted to know, would it survive the talc refining process? They never say, well, yes, we know it, it does. 1974, they go and they look at Argonaut. 15 of 38 samples come out with crisis talk. This is, this is incredibly important because in opening statement, council said, so not all talc is the same. There are different mines in different places, and some mines were well known to have asbestos. None that J&J &J used. Well, I mean, you've seen dozens and dozens of documents that prove that to be false. But this is important because this was for the Argonaut ore body. And Ms. Sullivan showed you this. An intensive examination has been made by X-ray diffraction and electron microscopy of 38 core samples taken from a new ore body that Windsor Minerals are contemplating exploiting. And what Ms. Sullivan said was, they said they're contemplating it. And yes, they found asbestos in it, but they were just contemplating using it. This is their Argonaut ore body. They did the drill cores in 74, and then they, they approved it for use in baby powder in 76. 
It would be one thing to say they did a test of a mine, saw asbestos, and said, we're not going to use that mine. So that was a real whopper. Okay? That was a big one. Objection. The suggestion was that they were contemplating this ore body. They found asbestos and then didn't use it. This was argonaut. It was one of the two cosmetic deposits that they used. And they used argonaut all the way until 2003. And then they switched to Chinese. Again, July 8, 1974, more asbestos. In 1974, Johnson & Johnson writes, again, I, I had mentioned this, if the results of any scientific studies show any question of safety of talc, J&J will not hesitate to take it off the market. Absolutely false. <clears throat> then in 1974, the company that actually mines in Italy puts out a pamphlet that says there's chrysotile on the top. They actually say that. What does Johnson & Johnson do? Well, they bring in their erasers, okay? William Nashad and Bill Ashton. They stopped the publication, and then they rewrote it for the Italians. And they took out the references to Christ's title. Remember, Hopkins said, well, in Italian, trace means none. But I showed you that, that I think it was before they even had fax machines. It was called a teletype. And the Italians wrote to Johnson & Johnson and said, well, in America, trace means 2%. For us, it means parts per million. It means few parts per million. It doesn't mean none. It means it's present. It means several parts per million. And then there's this in 1975. Confirmed asbestos. By electron microscopy, they look at samples of GI, gas apps industrial, WI, Windsor Industrial, and AC, Hammondsville Cosmetic. And they find asbestos in all three. Now, Dr. Hopkins says, well, these were just holes in the ground. That's utterly false. They had already labeled them with Gassettes and Windsor and HC. Gassettes is the mill. Gassettes is the mill. Windsor is the mill. If they're in the mill, they're not holes in the ground. We know that because look. Gassettes, Windsor, HC, cosmetic. Okay? So that was false. Again, they sent a letter saying the samples which are relevant to the production of sale of cosmetic towels in the U.S. and Canadian markets are those bearing the letters HC. Okay? Hammondsville Cosmetic. I asked Dr. Hopkins, okay, so we can agree, right? HC, you know is Hammondsville Cosmetic. Him, no. What does HC mean? It doesn't mean Hammondsville Cosmetic, right? Everybody in the room knows it means Hammondsville Cosmetic, including Johnson & Johnson's lawyer. Because four days earlier, she was questioning Dr. Weber, and she said, and Doctor, you know that they used HC, Hammondsville Cosmetic, talc for industrial talc sometimes as well. Okay? Everybody knew it was Hammondsville Cosmetic. And this discussion about they used it for industrial as well, remember you've got the big hole of the mine, and they pulled some for roofing and some for cosmetic. 1976, another doctor. This is at NIOSH. Um, and a journalist had asked this doctor at NIOSH. She then asked him about asbestos, and he said that this was a different problem and that he would not recommend using talc on babies because of the possibility of asbestos inhalation, regardless of the contamination level. He felt this would constitute an unnecessary risk. Again, doctor after doctor. If you buy the product, this is what you get. Talc and fragrance. Not this. Not asbestos. You never have. That's failure to warn. When you get to the question about was there a failure to warn, the answer is yes. Absolutely there was a failure to warn. If any mother or father saw even one of these documents, one of these documents, they'd never buy it again. Did they stop at that point? No. In fact, two years later, they exposed live infants and mothers to an inhalation study, showing that they inhaled the towel. Remember I asked Dr. Hopkins, when a baby is powdered with this stuff, they inhale it, right? And he hemmed and hawed, and I had to impeach him with his prior testimony. Yes, they inhale it. And Johnson & Johnson did a live experiments to prove it. In 76, the FDA asked for periodic testing. This is March 15, 1976. And the CTFA said, we will seriously consider this. Give serious consideration. 
Two weeks later, no, nope, we're not going to commit ourselves to do that. We'll keep our records, and if we need to use them at some point, then we'll use them. They never did. They never provided them to the FDA. By the way, they didn't provide them here either, guys. The, the, the periodic testing I told you all about, it's not here. There's literally three or four documents and evidence. They're defense documents. You can go dig them up. Where they did some XRD in the early 70s. They did some um, DTA, the, the differential thermal analysis, which Dr. Hopkins admit, it, admitted was basically worthless. They, they didn't give it to you. It's not here. All this periodic testing they went on and on about, not in the case. So remember the citizens' petition? They said they had no data from industry after 76. Right? When they responded to Philip Douay in 86, what did they say? They said, the FDA recognizes that asbestos inhalation over extended periods is hazardous. The agency is also aware that some cosmetic top products in the 60s and 70s did contain asbestos for minerals. Your petition has not persuaded us that the cosmetic top that is presently being produced contains significant amounts of asbestos in 86. They didn't have anything. No one was giving them any information, and they have no power to go get it. But of course, we know that three of seven samples failed their round-robin test in 76 that were then being, then being used. But of course, they argue, no, really, the samples passed. <coughs> of course, let's just use Johnson & Johnson's words. The method is not accurate, reliable, or practical. It's still in effect today. Ms. Sullivan said, why would you use a method where you can't find the most common type of asbestos? And she was talking about the concentration method, which does favor the amphibole minerals. You kind of have a choice. You can look with extremely, extremely high sensitivity and find the amphiboles, or you can look with lower sensitivity and maybe find some chrysotype. Okay, so it is. You kind of choose your own poison. Dr. Compton used a method where he didn't concentrate it, but he counted a lot more grid openings. Remember the grid openings, the more you count, the greater sensitivity you have, and he found some chrysotile in one of the adjacent rocks, but mainly amphibole. And Dr. Longo used concentration to get that sensitivity way, way down, and down means good. That's a better sensitivity. But I wanted to come back to this. She said, why would you use a method where you can't find the most common type of asbestos chrysotile? This is the, the method they adopted, J4-1, asbestiform amphibole minerals and cosmetic top. It doesn't look for chrysotile at all. Okay? So the method they chose is still in effect today. It doesn't look for Christ at all. Despite the findings in Argonaut, by Lewin, by Langer, etc. Remember they paid Jane Jay a visit in 76? The president of the baby product company showed up and they, they said, we want you to issue a press release. And that's when I said, I don't, we don't really want to. But then they ultimately did. Johnson Johnson wrote it. Mount Sinai wrote the cover letter. The reason I wanted to show you this is that they said that weekend they'd studied six new samples of talc and had reported asbestos in all of them. J and J said, J and J assured the Mount Sinai management that such a statement should be avoided in case the analysis is wrong. Right? So Mount Sinai said, we found six new hot samples. And J and J said, no, it could be wrong, so those shouldn't be in there. I don't know Mount Sinai's motivations, but they agreed. They, they, they left it out, and that press release went out without that information. We do know something about it, though. This is Exhibit 3099. Irving J. Selikoff, chairman of the department and a leading authority on occupational diseases, said the apparent discrepancy between FDA's findings and Mount Sinai's is due to a difference in technique. FDA's methods are not sensitive enough to measure asbestos below a certain level, he said. And remember, this is what Johnson & Johnson knew when they had Lewin re-look at the samples with optical that wasn't going to see chrysopile. The FDA uses differential thermal analysis, DTA, and optical microscopy. These are not as sensitive as electron microscopy, the method used at Mount Sinai. And he said he took exception to the statement issued by Mount Sinai's pediatrics department that baby talcum is safe and useful. He said, I think they will live to regret this. And I don't know whether anybody in Mount Sinai regrets it, but the problem was that statement that went out, that Johnson & Johnson went to their office, five of them, including the president, and said he issued this press release and it went to 100 newspapers. People read it, and they said, okay, well, it says it's safe. 
1984, uh, this is the inspection of the Italian towel. Um, counsel said, well, they found it in the air. It wasn't in the towel. I just wanted to point out that the paragraph she, she read from, they explain why. Why did it escape in the bulb? Why did it escape detection by XRD? The answer is that the detection limit for enthophilite by XRD is only about 2% as compared to 0.2 or 0.5 for termalite. So they found enthophilite in the air samples, which we showed you, and then they didn't find it in the bulb because their detection limit was only 2%. XRD, the J4-1 method that the industry adopted was XRD. Dr. Blount, I want to talk to you about this. She, she went through and she tried to tell you that the, the tables were messed up. They're not messed up at all. Look, five Montana samples. There they are. Three Vermont samples. Vermont. One, two, three. Right? So these J, K, L, M are from two different samples divided up over four and then the baby powder. Three Vermont, one North Carolina, one Alabama, and then four foreign. There's three in the list. One, two, three. And then she says here, four foreign included in study, some not included in the report. All of that effort Johnson Johnson is going through to try to run away from the fact that this is Johnson's baby powder. She says, Blount sample I is Johnson's baby powder in the paper she mentions. The table shows no asbestos. See, no asbestos in sample I. I need to show these to you. She wrote two papers, 1990 and 1991. In 1990, she used traditional techniques. She did not use concentration. Okay? She says that here. She says sample I was the same in both papers. Because if you're going to compare things one for one, you have to have the same samples. You can't say, we found it in one, and we didn't find it in another, if they're different samples. She was doing different methods on the same samples. That's why this is so important. She says, although my papers report an improved method for analysis, the determinations for sample labeled I, Johnson & Johnson's for Montau, have been done by traditional methods as well, um, and that's table two in the 1990 paper. As I told you, I believe it contains asbestos. So look. No concentration method in this paper. She doesn't find any asbestos. Concentration method. She finds a lot of asbestos. And she reiterates it in 1992 to Taub de Luzenac in France, and in 1998 to the J&J &J lawyers. And then they try to hire her in 1998. She reiterates it again to John O'Shaughnessy. They showed you this questioning by the Johnson & Johnson lawyer in 2018, by the way, where they say, so as I understand it, if you have sample I, and for example, let's say that that's a Johnson & Johnson product, just for example, right, talking generically, then the next time you don't want sample I necessarily to be Johnson & Johnson, then you'll know what the results are before you start, right? Generically, if you're just doing random samples and you're just testing them randomly, you don't want to know what they are. Objection. Okay. Okay. I don't want to. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I have to sign up. Yes. First, Your Honor, it's been called into court. I'm closed on the screen, Your Honor. It's already stricken at me. This is so prejudicial. I'm told you, Your Honor, I'm stricken at me. He's going to get down on the table again. Second, they know that the position, those questions are talking specifically about that paper. If you go back two pages, they're specifically talking about it. I'm showing the quote you showed. It's completely misleading. But you lower your voice. That deposition is not a point. No, no, that's actually fine. Excuse me. Excuse me. Arguments are to the court, not to each other. Actually, your arguments were absolutely done. Over the rules, continue. So this is the quote Miss Sullivan showed you. So she says, oops. So she says, the, the JJ lawyer says, for example, let's say, let's say that that's a Johnson Johnson product. Then the next time you don't want sample I necessarily to be Johnson Johnson, because then you'll know what the results are before you start. Remember, she was looking at two different methods. And she said, I don't want to, let me, I, I won't know, even if I put I there, I wouldn't know. I want the letters to be different each time in different order 
so that I don't have no idea which one's which when I'm running it, so I'm not biased subconsciously, because that could happen. So that's why I put these numbers. And then she's asked this question. Dr. Blount, after all these questions that are said and done, after everything that's been discussed, just based on what you did in your work, in your life, never dreaming lawyers would contact you. Can you affirm that for decades, in the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s, Johnson & Johnson baby powder sold on the shelves at a sold on the shelves, had asbestos and asbestos for a minute, answer, yes. And ma'am, has your opinion changed at all? Did you find asbestos in the Johnson & Johnson baby products sold on the shelves on multiple occasions? I did. She's right here at Rutgers. Objection. Dr. Longo, uh, so Ms. Sullivan said, Dr. Longo says there's no trouble like in Vermont. That's not true either. We showed you this. He found mainly anthophilite and plenty of tremolite in the Vermont. And then in 2004, Forensic Analytical Lab looks at new samples of, they looked at Revlon and they looked at Johnson's baby powder and they find 0.2% anthophilite asbestos in the baby powder. So, one of the questions that uh, Council for Johnson Johnson addressed was, what are the people who have nothing to gain from positive, from positive results, right? Look at those people. Right? Not Dr. Longo, not Dr. Compton, not Dr. Weber, anybody like that. Okay, we did. All of these different institutions, at one point or another, found asbestos. That's Alice Blount right there. What lengths did they go to bury the truth? Because they did. And you saw it here. I just want to reiterate some of that for us. She said, what does this whole G11 issue have to do with the case? Well, I'll tell you. Remember, this is... They are looking at Shower to Shower in 1971. G11 has not been used in the product for three years. Okay? They find chrysotile asbestos okay, in the Shower to Shower and a sample of G11 they had there. And McCrum says, I left out comments on G11 from the report because I felt you might want to change your supplier or investigate your supplier, and this would only tend to confuse the issue perhaps with the FDA. So I, that big X there, not in the report, okay? But here's why that's important. They found Crestile in the shower shower. G11 hadn't been in the product for three years. Yet they were saying, well, maybe we can blame the G11. You talk about urban legends, right? She shows you a picture of the giant stadium where Jimmy Hoffa apparently is buried. He's not buried in the giant stadium. He's buried under all of the deleted data. That's where he is. Then they lied about that to the FDA. Remember, that was October 12, 1971, that report. And then in 73, they say, Dr. Lewin's samples are at variance with the results of earlier work done on the Shower to Shower product by Walter McCrone, uh, 12 October 71. That was the report where they exited out, where they had found Crestile in Shower to Shower. But the final report didn't say that. And by the way, I want to point out, that there was a, a, a big argument here with Dr. during Dr. Hopkins, where I had that X'd out paper, and Johnson and Johnson, I said, I didn't get this from you. You didn't give this to me. And uh, Johnson Johnson lawyer said, we, we did. We, we gave that to you. And we demonstrated we had to go to McCrone to get that. They gave us the edited sheet. It's not the one that was X'd out. So we had to go and get that. Again, the truth shouldn't take long to tell, but when you have to go and dig it up, it takes a little bit longer. The Sullivan study. They found Chrysotile two times in air samples, pre-publication, which Johnson Johnson had. They were deleted in the final. That's the, that's the um, Sullivan NIOSH report. This is not urban legend like the Loch Ness Monster. She put up that slide that showed ghosts and all of this stuff. That was very cute and very funny. But we're not the ones hiding things. We weren't the ones trying to trying to put urban legend status on the fact that there's asbestos in baby powder. So it's cute to do that. All right? But that's not the truth. The reason it's all coming to light now in the past few years is because the documents are out. They're not an honest company. This is Doc, this is um, Roger Miller where he says there's never been asbestos, ever. And I asked Dr. Hopkins, you understand that's perjury, right? He said, yes. 
this was false. Under oath, it was false. But then, remember, Miss Sullivan came and asked some questions. She said, is it really perjury? And he goes, no. He said, well, it says as sold. As sold, there was no asbestos. And again, the joke there is, they didn't treat the industrial talc at all. Right? They took it out of the ground, smashed it up, and sold it. Right? And then for the cosmetic, they floated it, and they admitted they couldn't get the, all the asbestos out. So it's still false. He admitted it was perjury when I was asking him questions. This happened in this courthouse. Okay? That lie, that perjury, took place here. Johnson & Johnson has a truth problem, and it seems to get worse when they're under oath. The only urban legend is that Johnson's baby powder was ever asbestos-free. That's Sasquatch. And they brought the Johnson & Johnson excuse factory here, okay? Baby powder isn't dusty. Don't believe our commercials. Remember he said, he said, oh no, that's not the right way to use the product? In their own commercials? Musco just made a mistake. She never says she made a mistake. Samples were spiked, but I can't prove it. HC doesn't mean anything. Hardly means none. Trace means none. Deleting data gives more info. So here's where we are. We've been lying for five decades. Believe us now. That's what Johnson, where Johnson & Johnson is. Bring the lawyers into the courtroom and say, believe us now. Believe our read on these documents. Believe the things we, we suggest but can't prove. The judge will give this instruction. If you believe that any witness or party willfully or knowingly testified falsely to any facts significant to your decision in this case, with intent to deceive you, you may give such weight to his or her testimony as you may deem it is entitled. You may believe some of it, or you may, in your discretion, disregard all of it. So, one of the laws is that a corporation is supposed to be treated with the same rights as a person. That's, that's, that's a law. Would we, would we let a person get away with this? Would we let someone who lied over and over and over again about something, about a cancer-causing agent that they were willfully exposing babies and infants to, would we let a person, anyone in our life, get away with that? Objection. The answer is no. We wouldn't. You have to treat them like any other person and hold them responsible. Did they accept responsibility for a single thing they said or did here? A single thing. Did they ever say, you know, yeah, Miller shouldn't, Miller shouldn't have lied. They had, they had many reports of asbestos in this. Miller shouldn't have lied. And that's on him. But we have other defenses. Everything was spontaneous. But they, didn't, they never accepted anything. And that has been the MO for all the documents you've seen in the last 50 years. What's the common thread in so many of these lies? Bill Ashton, William Nashett, and the J&J Company lawyers. They hung Nancy Moscow out because they knew people would trust her because she was a burn nurse. In, in terms of PR, it was a brilliant move. Right? We all want to trust people who have done that type of work. But internally, we've seen their thought process. What they write for their website. The products have always been, we can't say always, it's best for That's the truth. We want to tell, we'd like to tell CTFA that we are okay with forwarding a literature review to the National Toxicology Program did you have a suggestion on a sentence that addressed the fact that our source of talc never had asbestos in it? Never in quotes, right? So when you get to the question, have plaintiffs proven by a preponderance of the evidence that any of the following defendants' talc products were not reasonably fit, suitable, or safe for its intended or reasonably foreseeable use because they lacked adequate warnings or instructions, your answer will be yes. But let me, let me uh, go back to something that D'Angelo McNeil said. She was asked this question, D'Angela, when you picked up that thing of baby powder, did you have any reason to believe that it's dangerous? No, because it's for babies. It's for babies, so it shouldn't be that. There's no point for me to look into warning. Right? Why would, 
First of all, there is no warning. And second of all, why would anybody think, oh, I better check and make sure this is safe. It's supposed to be safe. It's advertised as safe. They tell you it's safe. And in that respect, the answers to these should be yes. There was a failure to warn. How did Johnson Johnson hamstring the testing that was done? First, the FDA, remember, the FDA proposed a regulation. The CTFA and Johnson & Johnson went to them and said, no, we will self-regulate, trust us. And when it was all said and done, they said, the FDA proposed optical method was literally destroyed by us. How come we are suggesting it now? To the extent that you believe that the FDA is a government agency and all-powerful, well, J&J &J and the CTFA destroyed their regulation, it disappeared. And we knew why they wanted to do it. The CTFA, the task force, has completed the process of development of analytical procedures for determining the presence of chrysotile and tremolite and talc. We believe it is critical for the CTFA to now recommend these methods to FDA before the art advances to more sophisticated techniques with higher levels of sensitization. I'm only showing you these again because we talked about them so long ago with Dr. Hopkins and they're all in evidence, but I just wanted to reiterate, any time they had a chance to use better testing, they pushed back. That's not zero tolerance. That is protect ourselves, is what that is. And they're going to try to say again, we went back and forth on this document, grave concern, we have grave concern about TEM. From the beginning of this case, Ms. Selby kept saying, that's not us saying it. That was uh, some people at the CTFA. Okay, well, first of all, even if it was, they're in the CTFA. No one ever objected to that. Okay, they're, they lead the CTFA. But it wasn't. It was them. This was a meeting. It's Exhibit 3119. Feel free to look at it. It's a meeting of all J&J people at Johnson & Johnson. And they say grave concern was expressed by the meeting with the inclusion of TEM as a follow-up to optical. Okay? How do we know it's them? Because before Dr. Hopkins answered Ms. Sullivan's questions, he answered mine. And I asked. And then, of course, within Johnson & Johnson, they had CTFA talc for, talc force, a task force that was three or four individuals who were following this issue, correct? Yes. Proposed by the task force were outlined, grave concern was expressed by the meeting with the inclusion of TEM as an alternate follow-up to optical dispersion if the sample fails, it should say DTA, and passes optical. Did I read that right? Yes. And Johnson and Johnson's people here were expressing grave concern at the inclusion of TEM in the proposed method. Yes. Okay. I kept having to run down Dr. Hopkins and get him back based on his prior testimony over and over and over again. Because any chance he took to try to paint a better picture for Johnson Johnson, he did. They designed tests so the talc couldn't fail. Right? They picked the bathroom scale instead of the scientific scale. The J4 method was half a percent sensitivity. And I drew one of these on the board, right? So if the asbestos is down here and the sensitivity is up here, it's going to be non-detected. We know that was the case. Non-detect, non-detect, non-detect. That's what they wanted. They did have the super-duper microscope, right? Super-duper. That doesn't mean you can't hamstring that, too, and they did. How did they do that? By drafting testing method 7024, which says that that's a non-detect for anthophilite fibers. For crestiles, non-detect. For actinolites, non-detect. For tremolite, non-detect. No quantifiable asbestos detected. And Ms. Sullivan tried to say, look, we recorded when they found two or three fibers. We recorded that. I agree. In 1975, you did. But you designed testing method 7024 in 1977. And after that, no quantifiable asbestos. No quantifiable asbestos. No quantifiable. And we proved it. Here. This is 1985. Uh, 1985. They found chrysotile on two samples. Roger Miller writes to McCrone and says, you're supposed to send those results to me. You send them to somebody else. And you're supposed to use very, spe you're supposed to use specific language. Right? The report reports two samples of chrysotile. Final report, no quantifiable amount. Follow our method. You find it, you don't record it. Again, 1990. Anthophilite chrysotile asbestos on the count sheets. The report, no quantifiable amount of asbestos minerals. 
Remember, Dr. Hopkins says there, there should be 800 TEM reports, right? I don't think there's any evidence of their periodic testing. I don't think they introduced any of them. We've actually seen the asbestos fibers, too, because Windsor Minerals, Cypress, was looking at them using 7024. When Cypress bought the mine from them in 1989, they were using 7024, and we see what they found, because they took pictures of it, right? Actinolite. When it was asbestos, they said actinolite. When it was a cleavage fragment, they said actinolite cleavage fragment. I'm going to show you that. But look, right here. They found the asbestos, and it says, no quantifiable amount. 9101, 9101. Next one. 9106, 9106, actinolite. 9135, 9135, actinolite. 9140, 9140, 9140. Look here, actinolite, actinolite huge fragment. Fiber, chunk. No detectable amounts, no quantifiable amounts. So, this is the evidence. This is asbestos. Asbestos. Final report, no quantifiable amount. Johnson & Johnson's method. So, I think the greatest defense they have in this case is your own disbelief. I think that's their greatest defense. Because before, I, I assume that before you came in here and you saw this evidence, you had a picture of Johnson & Johnson in your mind, right? The same picture we all have, or had. But it's very different than the reality. And so you have to set aside your disbelief and look at the truth, look at the facts. So look at the method sensitivity levels here. So Johnson & Johnson sensitivity, oops. Johnson & Johnson sensitivity. Allows 56, at a minimum, 56 million fibers to be present before you can say quantifiable asbestos detected. Dr. Sanchez, we didn't really get into him. He didn't, he wasn't here. FDA, right, the floor tile method, 12 million 500,000 fibers per gram before they'll detect anything. J4, half a percent by weight, we know that. Dr. Longo's testing was 1,500 times more sensitive because he concentrated it and he looked at more grid openings looked at 100 grid openings instead of the 10 that the FDA looked at. Okay? But what does that mean in practical terms? If you use the FDA's, the method the contract lab used, or TM7024, their detection limits are way up here. And so you get this no water detected even though there's water there. And Dr. Longo's method is here. Now it doesn't go all the way to zero. Right? It takes a lot more time to get there. But it got way, way, way lower, 5,000 times lower, 1,500 times lower. So what exactly testing were they doing, right? They did one test, XRD, right? That sort of, I'm going to say it's just worthless test. Um, for every two silos, every 650 tons, they did one test by XRD. And then their protocol was to do between 4 and 16 TEM tests a year. Okay? But we don't, we don't have them. We don't, we don't have that in evidence. I think that a question that we would like to have asked is, do they say no quantifiable asbestos on them under their method? Because we've seen those reports where they say no quantifiable asbestos, but then we see the underlying data and it's there. So at the beginning of this case, Ms. Sullivan, this is her quote from opening. And they tested hundreds and hundreds of thousands of samples. False. Hopkins, it should be around 800 tests. And then here we are today. Where is it? Objections. Overruled. Stop speaking objections. So Dr. Hopkins said, well, what we did is we took hourly samples from the 650 tons. And then when we had the 650 tons of samples from that, then we did one test. That's not hundreds of thousands of tests. That's one test. Right? And he, I, I asked, I said, you're diluting it. If you'd only do one test out of a giant bucket, that's one test. That's not hundreds of thousands of tests. And he said, I agree. I said, are there hundreds of thousands of tests? And he said, no, there's not. 
The testing was a rubber stamp. We know that. They tested in their entire history 0.0032 grams ever by TEM. Ever. For all of the United States, that's what they tested. Remember we showed the, we, we weighed the mint, right, the breath mint? Got it here. And their actual testing was 250 times less than this. Total amount of talent. When they say it's safe, they tell everybody it's safe, that's what they're basing their own. There's an exhibit for that. So the reason I say, I'm saying that is um, that if there's any questions about anything, literally there's an exhibit that addresses just about every issue in this case. Right? Well, so maybe someone, when you're deliberating, maybe someone says, well, didn't Lewin, didn't Lewin um, go back and look at his studies uh, at his samples and then find nothing? Someone else might say, well, you know what? I think there's a document that shows that they, they required him to do it by optical and that wasn't going to find the Christ time. You can go find that. It's all there. And so when you're deliberating, please remember the exhibits tell you what happened. And their strategy today is the same as it was then, compromise them. I'm going to show you that. What did they do in the 70s? They started by attacking scientists. They drew up a, a list of enemies, antagonistic personalities, Mount Sinai, just other people at Mount Sinai, the director of the New York EPA, Dr. Weissler at the FDA, Dr. Lewin at NYU, enemies. Okay? Professor Paoletti comes out in 1984 with Italian talc having asbestos in it. And Ashton says, I'm going to talk to some people hoping they might have some ideas on how to compromise it. And then increased pressure from consumer advocates can require such high expenditures for technical support needed to compromise them that our profits can approach seriously diminishing returns. They spent a lot of money and a lot of effort to go do what they did, to try to compromise consumer advocates and scientists. And they said it right there. You know, you, you hear the, the, it's cliche to say, oh, a company put profits over safety, right? It's cliche because we, we hear that all the time. That's what lawyers say when they're, they're on the steps of the courthouse. They put profits over safety. Here, here they actually say it, okay? They influenced the NIOSH study. This is the one with the 392 people. And I showed you this quote already, where they say we can responsibly predict the outcome of the study and even influence the conclusions, right? We attempted to and in fact created a mystique around our talc involvement through our operations and factual knowledge. This is why NIOSH, NIOSH which is a government agency, is trying to do the study. And these guys are all over them. And they directed the study, and then they influenced it. <clears throat> and what was their scientific approach? Our current posture with respect to sponsorship of talc safety studies has been to initiate studies only as dictated by confrontation. This philosophy so far has allowed us to neutralize or hold in check data already generated by investigators who question the safety of talc. The principal advantage for this operating philosophy lies in the fact that we minimize the risk of possible self-generation of scientific data, which may be politically or scientifically embarrassing. Was this a responsible company? No. The only time they did scientific work was to fight other researchers. And then they injected their own bias into science. This is the first Rubino paper. They funded the work so they could control it. They approved the protocol to exclude sick people, edited the manuscript, authored the discussion and conclusion section, concealed their involvement, and hired a ghostwriter to rewrite it. Ms. Sullivan showed you this document where, where Stefano, who was the middleman, um, the, the son-in-law of the mine owners in Italy, he wrote back and said, well, we're not going to include your discussion and conclusion section. But he added, as you can see, the enclosed, enclosed draft has no conclusion. We think that this part could eventually be written with your help if we were able to get to, together in New Brunswick one or two days before the Washington meeting. So we're going to get together and we're going to write it together. Johnson & Johnson, nobody there appears on these papers, but they did initiate the Italian studies to control it, and they did. And then the second paper, 
right? Ms. Sullivan showed you this. She said, we didn't delete any cancers. Well, let me show you. See the other sites section? Other sites? In the pre-publication, there's 41 cancers. The publication is 23. In, uh, for, this is the Miners and the Millers. 24 in the Millers, 10 in the publication. And then they dictated what went into the papers. Phil Ashton said, there's chrysoprestyle with alchazone mineralization. He says, it's advisable that Rubino have more than one reference which cites post-rock mineralization and absence from chrysoprestyle. Right? So you've got Ashton saying in 1972, there's chrysoprestyle in the mineralization. Then you have him saying, it's advisable that we tell Rubino more citations about no chrysoprestyle. And then guess what? In the final paper, there's two citations about no chrysoprestyle. Ms. Sullivan said, you don't just wake up one day and decide to do horrible things J&J is accused of doing. I agree, you don't. You don't just wake up one day. It happens gradually. Because that's how people, that's how people ultimately end up doing bad things. It's just not, you don't wake up one day and go, I'm evil. I'm bad. It's gradual. It started because they bought the mine. Right? Why did they do this? We have a large investment in a talc mine. They bought the mine. They found out there was asbestos in it. Oops. What do we do? And there's where that human, that human factor comes in. Do we do the right thing? Do we dump this thing? Which J&J &J had all the power to do. Do we dump it? Or do we keep going? Well, they kept going. But it wasn't just because of the investment in the talc mine. You're going to see a video a little bit later with uh, Moshe. Well, they had a gold mine, too. But that gold mine wasn't physical bullion you pull out of the ground. It was the trust of mothers and babies. Okay? The trust of people who were buying product. And they wanted to burnish the golden egg. You're going to hear that from their own person. If there's a money train, they're the railroad. Okay? All the effort and time, money, they put into compromising these people, to hiring all of these different consultants to go and attack individual researchers one by one. That's the railroad. So who's actually protecting the public? Right? Church. There's no FDA. They have no power. They have no regulatory power whatsoever. There's no other government agency that does that. And that also might be something that, before you came in here, you weren't aware of. Cosmetics are utterly unregulated, but for color additives. Objection. Overruled. And, you know, and so I have this here, did you ever think, right? Did you ever think that you would be across the table from Johnson & Johnson? See, the thing is, the great thing about the jury system is that once a company's here, they can't get up and leave. They have to hear what you have to say. They have to listen to you. They don't have to listen to us. They don't have to listen to our clients, but they have to listen to you. They don't listen to the FDA. They don't have to. They have to listen to you. So on defective design, last issue, and I'm just about finished. <clears throat> have plaintiffs proven by a preponderance of the evidence that any of the following defendants' towel products were defectively designed because the risk or danger of the product at, as designed outweighed its usefulness and therefore a reasonable, reasonably careful manufacturer or supplier would not have sold the product in the form in which it was sold. And this is the discussion about cornstarch. Safer alternatives. Zero danger for asbestos. Zero cancer danger. Right? They always had that safer alternative. They did tests. They did interviews. They did market surveys. They knew pediatricians were strongly biased against the use of talc um, for baby powder on infants because they are concerned about potential inhalation problems. Again, that's all the way into the 1980s. Guys, this started in the 50s. The, the, the pediatricians were saying no. Then they interviewed people. The usage data confirms market facts, retail audits, that Johnson's baby powder with cornstarch has been accepted by the consumer as a formula replacement for all qualities. It was either equal to or higher on all qualities than talc. Not only did they have another product that was a suitable replacement, it was better. 
And then they said, this is their ad, doctors trust cornstarch because it's the safest powder you can use on your baby. Safest powder you can use on your baby. Does that mean that all babies are good for cornstarch? No. Does that mean all babies are good for talc? No. No product is perfect for everyone. But on the whole, based on all the surveys they did, consumers preferred this. And Johnson & Johnson said it was the safest. And then they answer the question for you. Because that question is sort of, did the risks outweigh the benefits? Of course. This is a, this is a product with no health benefit, no medicinal benefit, and a huge risk. Johnson & Johnson said, the physician, however, would need affirmation of safety in benefits risks terms. An attempt to do this at this point in time would undoubtedly beg questions in the minds of some, and it would only take a few inquisitive physicians to reopen the whole issue. A facet of the situation not yet considered is that of the efficacy of body powder. A considered approach to all health products is that of benefit versus risk. While it has generally been believed that baby powder provides lubricity, thus reducing chafing, may absorb more absorb moisture, etc. This has not been proven insofar as we know. So they're advertising all of these things, but they're like, we, we haven't really proven that. <clears throat> Risk, benefit. Risk. Cancer, inhalation. No medicinal benefit. Right? Because when we think about drugs, like drugs, chemotherapy, right? Requires to do the chemotherapy. Awful side effects. Awful. The risks are high, but the benefits, the potential benefits, are also important. So people opt to do things that may have awful side effects because they need the benefit. Here, this product, it's, it's a powder that has a nice smell. It has no benefit. And it has terrible risks. So the answer to that question is yes. Did the risks outweigh the usefulness and therefore a reasonably careful manufacturer or supplier would not have sold the product in the form in which it was sold? What would a reasonable person do if they knew there was asbestos? They wouldn't sell. And in fact, Johnson & Johnson articulated that, remember? They told the FDA, if there was any concern about asbestos in the product, we'll take it off the market. They didn't. But they understood that was the calculus. That was the appropriate thing to do. So the verdict forms. Um, I have it back here. Where is it? Sorry. OK, thank you. So this is the one for um, Doug and Rosalind Barden. And can we switch to the, oh, up here. Which one is it? Three? Three. OK. So the verdict forms, questions one through seven are the same on each verdict form. So you're going to get four verdict forms, one for each person, okay? Questions after seven are the damages questions, okay? Those, you'll assess those differently for each person. But for question one, and these will be the same for each. Which one's autofocus? There it is. Okay. Have the plaintiffs proven by a preponderance of the evidence that, in this case, Douglas Barton was exposed to asbestos from any of the following defendant's products? And the answer, of course, is yes. He had exposure before and after 1978. Have they proven by a preponderance of the evidence that any of the following top products were not reasonably fit, suitable, and safe for their intended and reasonably foreseeable uses because they lacked an adequate warning or instruction? The product had asbestos in it, and it had no warning. Have they proven by a preponderance of the evidence that Douglas Barton's exposure to asbestos from any of the following defendant's talc products that lacked adequate warnings or instructions was a substantial factor in causing his mesothelioma? Yes. And remember, that substantial factor just means more than trivial or inconsequential. Design defect. 
have plaintiffs proven by a preponderance of the evidence that any of the following defendants' talc products were defectively designed because the risk or danger of the product as designed outweighed its usefulness and therefore a reasonably careful manufacturer or supplier would not have sold the product in the form in which it was sold? The answer to that is absolutely yes. Johnson & Johnson said this internally. Have they proven that that design defect was a substantial factor? Yes. Lastly, manufacturing defect. And remember, defect does not mean broken. No one is saying that the product was broken. We're saying that it was flawed in one of three ways. Failure to warn, it didn't meet specs, or its risk outweighed its benefits. And here, it failed to meet specifications or standards because it was supposed to have zero asbestos. So if it had asbestos, then the answer is yes. And again, have plaintiffs proven by a preponderance of the evidence that Doug Barton's exposure to asbestos from any of the following defendants' talc products were defectively manufactured was a substantial factor in causing his music to live? Yes. And then you'll get to the damages question. And for, uh, for Mr. Barton and Mr. Ronning, Moshe's going to talk about that. And for um, D'Angelo McNeil, um, Chris is going to talk about that. Yes. This would be a good time to take the break. Oh, okay. okay. I probably have 10 more minutes. I'll take the break. Yes. Uh, members of the jury, we're taking the morning break now. Please be ready to come back upstairs at 14 o'clock. Enjoy your break. Remember, no discussions with regard to this case. You're not yet delivering. No research of any kind as well. Thank you. Good morning. Please be seated. Make sure all cell phones are turned off. <laughs> Mr. Pantier, you may continue. Thank you. Okay. So just to finish up, and then I'm going to sit down, ladies and gentlemen. And I've really appreciated your time and attention. But um, you know, when we have all that, we have all these documents and all these witnesses and all the science and everything. It's very easy to get. Uh, on a side road away from what the case is really about, uh, which is these people. And I'm going to speak about David Etheridge, uh, and then Chris and Mush will talk about um, D'Angelo, Will, and Doug. So I'm going to talk about David Etheridge. So this is a person, what, what, what I took from his testimony is that you've got somebody who is probably the most optimistic person I've ever come across. Um, in, the, in the face of what he's facing. Um, someone who has chosen the hard road throughout his life. Right? He's not a, he's not one of these people, so he's a pastor, right? And it's not, it's not just that he's in his church preaching, doing what he feels he needs to do, but he goes and he lives it, right? He, he has a practical impact on people's lives. Um, not just his own family. Uh, he took every Friday off to be with his children. Uh, I think he was in the Bahamas there, uh, building homes for people. So this is someone who had never took the easy route through life, um, always trying to benefit other people. You know, um, he, he was in charge of a, of a woman who had never had a family, a ward of the state, uh, for 10 years before she passed away. Um, and he did that outside of his ministry because it wasn't his job. So this is one of the people that is going to be lost. Um, early. We have to talk about damages. There's three aspects of damages for Mr. Etheridge. One is the financial damages. The other are his damages for what he has gone through and his wife. It is stipulated in this case that his lost earnings um, are between $1,328,127 and 
$1,434,358. That, those are stipulated, agreed upon between the parties. Um, and his life expectancy, the important part about that is part of that stipulation is that his life expectancy, had he not gotten mesothelioma, was supposed to be another 22 years, right? At age, age he's 59 now, he's supposed to live another 22 years. He's not going to. He's on immunotherapy. That will hopefully prolong his life some, but as Dr. Moline said, immunotherapy works for a little while and then it doesn't. Um, so he is going to die early, and he knows that. So that's economics. That's, that's the easy part. That's agreed to. You have a number. Then there's this part. Impairment, loss of enjoyment of life, and pain and suffering. I don't think I heard one complaint from him about what he's gone through. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's not what you expect sometimes. Uh, you... You watch TV and you see people who are talking about something that's happened to them that's horrible, and it's uh, you know, and they can't stop crying, and that's fine. But you didn't see that from him. But you know what he's been through, and you know how it's affecting him. Um, I want to talk about some of those things. He he got a fever before he went on a vacation. Remember, there was there was a parishioner who had uh, a place where they could go stay in Hawaii, so they decided to take a vacation. He was feeling sick before he went. Um, they gave him some antibiotics and said it's probably just an infection. He went. He ended up going to the hospital there. Um, his abdomen got distended when they were uh, in Hawaii and ended up going to get a CT. Um, they drained 12 liters of fluid from him, two times, six liters apiece. That's how much fluid collected because of the tumor. <clears throat> Imagine that, right? Um, he had a CAT scan on vacation. They said it's cancer. They came right in and they said it's cancer. Um, we're not sure what type, but they gave him some steroids so he could enjoy the rest of his vacation, I guess. Um, do you remember he said, he said, oh, there was a bright side to this. I wasn't with my kids. Ten days later, back home, he's diagnosed. He has a 10-hour surgery. They removed his entire spleen, part of his pancreas, all of his colon, six and a half pound tumor. They open him up, they put in heated chemotherapy. That's the one where they, they fill your abdomen with hot chemo, temporarily close you up and, and roll you back and forth to soak everything. Then they drain it out and they sew you up. 20-day hospital stay, and infection, and recurrence. So, how do you compensate for that? For what he's been through and what he will be through? The law says that we can't tell you, we can't suggest a number to you, so I won't do that. That's your job. But when you think about this, I want you to think about this is someone's entire life that is being taken, right? And if somebody if somebody is injured by somebody's negligence and it took their arm away, right? It took their arm, the use of their arm for the rest of their life. What kind of value would we put on that? It would be immense, right? You lose one entire arm for the rest of your life, it would be immense. What if you lose two or, or all of your limbs? You're still alive. Those would be immense damages. You would say, that person has to live the rest of their life without their arms or their legs or one arm or two arms. This is everything. This is a loss of everything. So how do you compensate that? Whatever number you choose, should you get there, together, it has to recognize that loss. <clears throat> and some people in jury selection said, how do you, how do you put a number on that? You can. And I'll just tell you that we know that whatever number you, you say is fair, no matter what it is, it will always be too low, right? Because no number can recognize the loss of a life, but that's the tool we have. That's what the civil justice system says you have to use. So it has to be a recognition. It will never make him whole. 
it will never get rid of the cancer. It will never put him back where he was. But it has to be a recognition. And it has to truly recognize that loss, whatever that number is that you come to. But whatever it is, we all know, it will, it will always be too low, no, no matter what it is, to put up against human life. So we acknowledge that. But it has to be a true recognition of the loss. Okay? Um, there he is smiling on a selfie after surgery. So this is who we're talking about here. And then there's the scar from that massive surgery. In his own words, he said, I'm delighted and I'm so thankful that I've lived to see Caroline and Charlie, my grandchildren, born. The grandchildren I have so far, and that I've had the gift of knowing them. For seven months and two years, Gavin, I'll let you read it. Okay. So then, the other element Darling. And the legal terms are loss of spousal services, society and consortium. That's the loss of the relationship. That's, that's what that means in non-legalese. And how much does he mean to the people who love him? This was a, this was a, a Monday morning at the chemo treatment place. And all these people from his church came and gathered for his last round. If his parishioner, if he means this much to his own parishioners, how much does he mean to his own wife? So when you look at this term, this legal term, this clean term, this is what it really means. What does she lose? And what she loses, you know, we talk about, we talk about love in poetic terms when we think of Hallmark cards. But that's not what love is, is it? Love and having that, that, that person with you in your life, it's a million little things. It's, uh, you come down and there's coffee made. <laughs> the, the newspaper's off the driveway. You know, and they're sitting there reading the paper. Being together, saying nothing. and then supporting each other. Darlene said she's come home and she saw him on the floor and she was worried that he had fallen and got hurt and he was painting because he's preparing the house for him not to be there. So using the tool that the civil justice system gives us, you have to recognize that loss too. For those years that are lost, those 22 years. Okay. And then I'm about to sit down. So thank you so much for your time. And I'm, I, I'm very sorry about my voice. Um, I'm just going to say this at the end. So. This is from one of their documents. I, I just showed that to you. And I just wanted to say that I think Johnson & Johnson hopes that when you see all of this, that you won't care. That you will share in their myopic view of the world that power and influence and the ability to go change science and all of that are the only currency and that truth is valueless because none of those lies were addressed none of those things that they did were addressed they didn't defend them they hope you don't care they hope you forget about them they hope you share in their view that if you're big enough you're powerful enough you can sell poison and they can expose children to it and that later in life and maybe that's why right Maybe they thought, well, the people we're exposing, they'll get, 
they'll get sick later in life. And that when they do, you won't care. That when a jury sees all your lies and your deceit, all for greed, they will come back with a, with a verdict that says, we don't care. You are the last line of defense, not the FDA, not the government. I think you know that now after seeing all this evidence. Your verdict needs to tell Johnson & Johnson that truth still matters to the rest of us and that there are consequences for telling lies that rip people from their families. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Mr. Blastel. Thank you, Your Honor.